Today, we will be discussing a disorder called fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia is a genetic mutation that causes normal bone to be replaced by fibrous tissue. It can lead to deformities and bone fractures. It is commonly associated with a mutation in the GNAS1 gene on chromosome 20q13.32. Lesions tend to progress until skeletal bone growth is complete. Histologically, fibrous dysplasia appears as short and randomly arranged trabeculae of bone that is often described as looking like Chinese characters. Fibrous dysplasia can be broken down into three types. First, there is a monostotic type that involves only a single bone. It can also present as a polyostotic type, which involves multiple bones. Finally, it may present as craniofacial fibrous dysplasia, which involves only the skull and facial bones. The clinical findings can be variable depending upon the location and extent of the lesions. The maxilla is the most commonly involved site within the craniofacial complex. However, there is also common involvement with both the proximal femur and the skull base. While fibrous dysplasia usually presents asymptomatically, it can present with fractures, limping, pain, or even loss of ambulation. A possible rare symptom is occasional neural complications caused by cranial base deformities. Each of these symptoms can be important for determining diagnosis. In regards to the population that fibrous dysplasia affects, one study discovered that among Chinese populations, fibrous dysplasia is more likely to affect females, with 58% of patients with fibrous dysplasia being a female. The average age of a patient being treated surgically for fibrous dysplasia was 27.1. It is important to remember that fibrous dysplasia occurs during skeletal development. Here is a graph showing the decades of life that patients were initially diagnosed with fibrous dysplasia. It is most commonly diagnosed in patients in the second and third decades of life. It's interesting to note that some patients were not diagnosed until after their 40s. Because fibrous dysplasia occurs during skeletal development, these likely were asymptomatic cases that had presented for years but were not diagnosed until much later. A key feature of fibrous dysplasia is that it is ill-defined on our radiographs. This essentially means we cannot confidently trace the borders of the lesion, and it has an overall hazy appearance. This feature is especially important because it helps us separate fibrous dysplasia from other fibroosseous lesions, such as ossifying fibroma and periapical cemento-osseous dysplasia. We also see that fibrous dysplasia often begins as a radiolucent lesion, and over a couple of years, the lesion appears mixed and then ultimately as a radio opacity. So the radio density changes as fibrodysplasia matures. And in the mature stage, we refer to the radiographic appearance as ground glass or granular. Ground glass is a very important term to remember as it almost exclusively refers to fibrous dysplasia. On this panoramic radiograph, we see this appearance in the patient's left maxilla. While fibrous dysplasia can appear bilaterally, it is much more common for it to appear unilaterally. We also see fibrous dysplasia in the maxilla twice as often as we see it in the mandible. On the picture on the left, we see a mandibular occlusal radiograph with unilateral fibrous dysplasia that has expanded the buccal and lingual plates. The radiographs on the right, we see an axial and coronal view of the patient's maxilla with unilateral fibrous dysplasia on the patient's right side. Unilateral anatomic expansion is a distinct finding with fibrous dysplasia. This means that the overall shape and form of the bony structures are maintained and intact, but they are expanded. This can be seen on the radiographs on the right as the lesion has unilaterally expanded both the buccal and lingual plates, but the overall morphology is generally maintained. Despite the anatomic expansion, we can see that the teeth are not displaced or resorbed. On the left periapical radiograph, we can see that there is no longer a clear, distinct lamina dura as it is blended into the fibrous dysplasia lesion. Fibrous dysplasia is a non-odontogenic lesion and can appear below the mandibular canal, which may superiorly displace the canal. Occasionally, we may see normal eruption impeded by fibrous dysplasia causing blockage or impaction of teeth. As discussed earlier, fibrous dysplasia can appear in other bones besides the craniofacial bones, such as the ribs or femur. Even though we will not view these radiographs as dentists, it may be helpful to see that fibrous dysplasia has a similar radiographic appearance in other locations in the body. There are four main conditions to consider for diagnosis. 
Paget's disease, osteomyelitis, osteoblastoma, and hyperparathyroidism. All of these are conditions that share some clinical and radiographic features with fibrous dysplasia. We are going to look into each of these separately and see how we could rule them out. Paget's disease is a disease associated with an inactivation mutation in the osteoprotagoran pathway. This leads to turnover of bone and expansion, much like fibrous dysplasia. Paget's disease is polyostotic and affects many areas at once. It shares a similar ground glass appearance that fibrous dysplasia presents with. Unlike fibrous dysplasia, Paget's nodular opacities of the calvarium and mosaic bone and histology are pathognomic features. It is commonly found in the elderly, although a juvenile form can occur. Paget's disease is typically found in older age individuals, differentiating it from fibrous dysplasia, which is in the young age groups. Osteomyelitis is a bacterial infection of the jaw commonly due to a pre-existing odontogenic infection or trauma. It is commonly found in the mandible and has a few different types or progressions. Diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis, abbreviated DSO, causes a dull pain unlike fibrous dysplasia, which is a relatively painless fibro-osseous lesion with expansion. DSO is a type of osteomyelitis causing expansion and later inflammatory periosteum stimulation. Fibrous dysplasia is unrelated to tooth pathologies. Proliferative periostitis and DSO require treatment to manage. To treat, we could do extraction or root canal of the necrotic teeth along with antibiotics. Cultures are used to test for antibiotic sensitivity prior to the beginning of a long-term therapy. This radiograph depicts a proliferative periostitis of the inferior border of the right mandible, apical to tooth number 30. As can be seen from the arrow on the radiograph, there's onion layering addition of periosteum. Osteoblastoma is a benign, solitary, non-odontogenic bone tumor that is not commonly found in the craniofacial region. It is most commonly found in the axial skeleton and long bones of young individuals. If found in the maxillofacial region, it is most often found in the mandible. Though benign, it is commonly associated with pain and expansion with an aggressive variant that can cause a large amount of local destruction. Osteoblastoma is a mass of hypocellular mineralized area with irregular trabecular patterns. It is very well defined, unlike fibrous dysplasia, which is diffuse and lacks defined borders. This lesion has a notable recurrence rate and even more so for more aggressive osteoblastoma types. Here's a radiograph of osteoblastoma of the right posterior mandible. It is a well-defined mixed opacity lesion just distal to the roots of tooth number 31. Hyperparathyroidism is a metabolic disorder involving the dysregulation of calcium and phosphorus due to elevated secretion of parathyroid hormone, abbreviated PTH. Oral manifestations can be due to primary or secondary hyperparathyroidism. Primary is when the parathyroid glands are hyperactive and secrete more PTH without stimulation, usually due to a parathyroid adenoma. Secondary is increased secretion of PTH due to low calcium levels, usually due to chronic kidney failure. Oral manifestations involve a diffuse ground glass appearance throughout the jaws. Some cases involve large facial bone enlargements, but due to onset of disease being slow and long-term, expansion is usually gradual. To differentiate from fibrous dysplasia, we must look at systemic symptoms, patient history, and most importantly, blood tests. Blood tests to assess PTH levels are essential to distinguish from fibrous dysplasia. There are important questions one must ask themselves when coming up with a differential diagnosis for fibrous dysplasia. What is the age of the patient? This can help distinguish Paget's disease from fibrous dysplasia as it is found in the elderly. Is the lesion in the maxilla or mandible? Fibrous dysplasia is more commonly in the maxilla, while osteomyelitis is usually in the mandible. How defined is the border of the lesion? The border of the lesion is one of the easiest ways to differentiate fibrous dysplasia and osteoblastoma. Additionally, osteoblastoma will have a more aggressive expansion profile. Are there lesions elsewhere in the body? Hyperparathyroidism in Paget's will likely have many extraoral manifestations. Is pain involved? Pain can be associated with osteomyelitis and osteoblastoma. Additionally, 
there is likely odontogenic infections and non-vital teeth associated with osteomyelitis. Have they ever been diagnosed with renal failure? Do they show signs of renal failure? Symptoms of hyperparathyroidism? Have they been diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism with blood tests showing elevated PTH? These are essential clinical questions to determine a diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia treatment is aimed towards managing symptoms and essentially waiting it out. Since fibrous dysplasia does not continue post-puberty, treatment such as cosmetic or corrective surgery is postponed until skeletal growth is complete. This could include orthodontic treatment or jaw resections and craniofacial fibrous dysplasia and limb lengthening procedures and fibrous dysplasia involving long bones of the body, such as the femur. If fibrous dysplasia is active and aggressive, surgery performed prior to puberty may be necessary. These patients usually present with intense pain and even paresthesia due to compression of nerve foramina. Currently, bisphosphonates and supplementation with vitamin D and calcium are being looked at as treatments for patients experiencing bone pain associated with active fibrous dysplasia lesions. However, this is currently an off-label use. Here are our references, and here are our image citations.